On this Sunday night, turning up the heat on Canada Day, scorching temperatures keeps thousands off the hill. The Prime Minister wasn't there either. He took his message on tariffs straight to Canadians as trade tensions with the U.S. reach a boiling point. The not-so-happy birthday message from Donald Trump. Also tonight, what's behind that series of brazen shootings in Toronto? And $77 million and for Leafs fans worth every penny. NHL star John Tavares comes home to Toronto. Is it enough to win the cup? This is The National. July 1st is a day to gather around the barbecue, wear red and white, and show off some Canadian pride. It's not usually very political, but this year, Canada Day falls smack in the middle of an escalating trade war. As Ottawa sat, slapped new tariffs on American products, the Prime Minister, well, he hit the road. With more, here's the host of Power and Politics, Vashi Capellas. <laughs> Same lyrics, different location. Justin Trudeau became the first Prime Minister in 43 years to miss out on Canada Day festivities on Parliament Hill. Instead, he was here, in Leamington, Ontario, hey, and then in Regina, trying to reassure workers affected by a trade war with the U.S. that kicked into high gear today with the implementation of $16 billion of Canadian tariffs. Canadians stand up for each other, that's what we do. His Canada Day message was decidedly optimistic. Of course there are always challenges, but fully confident that we can work together and overcome whatever lays in our, uh, in our path. But overcoming those challenges just got even harder. U.S. President Donald Trump didn't mince words in an interview on Fox this morning. NAFTA, I could sign it tomorrow, but I'm not happy with it. I, I want to make it more fair. Okay, I want to make... You can't do NAFTA before the midterms. I, I want to wait till after the election. Translation? Expect the trade war between our two countries to last at least until those midterm elections in November. And in the meantime, things will probably get worse before they get better. You know why? They're going to build their cars in America. They're going to make them here. The president is ratcheting up threats to slap a tariff of up to 25% on vehicles imported to the United States. Trump claims he'll be able to impose them under the pretense of national security, just like he did with steel and aluminum as soon as a month from now. I don't think it's going to disappear anytime soon. I think this is going to continue for, for a while. This president hasn't shown that he's interested in backing away from a fight. And there are already bruises from that fight here. Tenaris, a company that makes steel pipes, laid off 40 workers in northern Ontario today because of American steel tariffs. The fear, of course, is that this is just the beginning. A very different Canada Day and an unprecedented time for this country. Vashi Capellos, CBC News, Ottawa. It wasn't just the Prime Minister who skipped the festivities on the Hill. He went to mingle with other Canadians in other parts of the country. But the crowd in the nation's capital, well, it dropped dramatically from last year, in part thanks to oppressive temperatures. It felt like 47 degrees in Ottawa with the humidity, tying an all-time record for the city. And in spite of the misting machines and water stations, it was simply too hot to attract regular Canada Day crowds. It's very hot, but it's worth it to be here. We are Canadians. We can take a little heat whenever it comes. We'd be struggling without this. I was hoping it wouldn't be as, as hot as it, as it is. It topped out at 6,500 people on the hill at most. Last year, there were 25,000. Oh, that didn't stop the Governor General celebrating her first Canada Day on the job. She rolled onto Parliament Hill not in a limo or a Landau, but on a bike, a chance to highlight physical fitness. And her speech got interrupted by a friend. Hello? A fellow astronaut and dual Canadian-American Drew Foistel calling live from the International Space Station. We flew over the entire country from west to east, and I saw and photographed nearly every major city. And it's clear and sunny over most of the country, and that hopefully will supply good weather for a happy birthday party. In all of us Today also marked the first national holiday with the new gender neutral lyrics to O Canada, sung for the Parliament Hill crowd. 
Meanwhile, the Prime Minister responded for the first time about a very different issue today, an incident from nearly two decades ago, before he was even an MP, that recently resurfaced in news reports. Catherine Cullen brings us that story tonight. I had a, a good day that day. I don't remember any uh, negative interactions that day at all. That day was back in August 2000 at a B.C. festival. Justin Trudeau was 28, years before his political career began. The next day, an unsigned editorial appeared in the local newspaper, the Creston Valley Advance. It accused Trudeau of groping and inappropriately handling an unnamed young female reporter. There were no other specifics about the alleged physical contact. The editorial says when Trudeau was asked about the incident, he responded, I'm sorry, if I had known you were reporting for a national paper, I never would have been so forward. CBC News has spoken by phone and emailed with the woman who was the subject of the editorial. She said she wasn't interested in being associated with any further coverage of the story and she asked that her name not be used and that she not be contacted about the story again. CBC News has also spoken with the publisher of the newspaper from that time who remembers speaking with the reporter after the encounter. My recollections of, of the conversation where she came to me because it she she was unsettled by it. She didn't like what had happened. Um, she wasn't sure how she should proceed um, with it because, of course, we're talking uh, somebody who was known to the Canadian community. While she didn't see the interaction with Trudeau, the former publisher described what happened as a brief touch and said, in her opinion, it was not sexual assault. The editorial resurfaced online and in some news coverage in recent weeks, but today was the first time the Prime Minister was asked publicly about it. I remember that day in Creston well. It was a, a foundation, uh, Avalanche Foundation uh, uh, event uh, to support, uh, to support uh, avalanche safety. Uh, I had a, a good day that day. I don't remember any uh, negative interactions that day at all. The allegation itself is in sharp contrast to what Trudeau has said about his own past. As you look back at your own career, um, is there a, a chance at some point that your actions might have not been construed the way they were intended? I don't think so. I've been very, very careful all my life to be uh, thoughtful and to be respectful of people's space and, and people's, uh, uh, people's headspace as well. Prime Minister Trudeau would have known he was going to eventually be asked about what happened in Creston. Now he has to wait and see whether his answer ends the matter. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. Here's what else we're working on tonight on The National. John Tavares is a Maple Leaf. Word some fans who have suffered through those years of a Stanley Cup drought and a tough rebuild thought they'd never hear. The superstar homecoming just ahead. Plus, another tragic accident with a link to Humboldt, Saskatchewan. Our Olivia Stefanovic takes us to a community in mourning. But first, we know more tonight about the victims of that brazen daylight shooting in downtown Toronto. The easygoing mood of Canada Day weekend came to an abrupt halt when those shots rang out yesterday evening in the heart of the city, just a couple of weeks after another shooting at a playground. Here's where yesterday's attack happened. It's usually very busy along here, so it was a strange sight to see Queen Street today, sealed off for blocks, police investigating the scene, not far from the city's best-known landmarks, three people were shot, two of them have died. The CBC's Natalie Nanowski has more on who is involved. As shocked people watched police seal off Queen Street, they tried to come to terms with what they saw. I heard one gunshot. I looked outside because I thought it was fireworks. Um, I seen one young black man fall to the ground. Three people were shot. A woman was injured. Two men killed. Today, police released their names. 21-year-old Javante Smart and 28-year-old Ernest Motoque. Both known in the hip-hop community, especially Smart, who went by the name Smoke Dog. If I wanted, I get it. Get it. Straight to the top where I'm headed. They haven't reached like super international heights yet, but they, they've worked internationally quite a bit, and uh, they're definitely making pretty big pretty big waves here in Toronto. Big enough to tour with Drake in 2017. The Six's own released this on Instagram, saying all the inner lights being extinguished lately is devastating. I wish peace would wash over our city. The city's mayor addressed the violence and also pushed for tougher bail rules. 
Some of these people who are out on bail and have been doing this repeatedly, involved with gangs, uh, who are the only ones that pose a threat to the safety of the city. Smoke Dog is from Regent Park. His hip hop group, the Halal Gang. A few days ago, he posted a music video shot in a different government housing project, raising speculation that this video somehow sparked a neighborhood war. But experts warn against linking hip hop and violence. Hip hop often provides at risk youth with a creative alternative to the gang life. Toronto has become such a, a world stage for hip-hop and a lot of the things that these guys rap about in their songs and that are, are violent and that but that's just because they've been around it but it's not necessarily something that i think any of them are trying to promote or, or or glorify police aren't saying whether they have any suspects in mind but they are appealing to the public asking anyone with information or video to come forward natalie nanowski cbc news toronto and tonight, another shooting in downtown Toronto, this time near Kensington Market. Four people have been hurt, including one man who is in serious condition. Police say four suspects were seen running away. Well, now to Saskatchewan, where a small community is dealing with tragedy this weekend after a horrific car accident wiped out an entire family. Just months after the town of Humboldt was shattered by that bus crash that killed 16 people. And as Livia Stefanovic reports, there is a sad parallel between these two stories. It's, it'd be difficult for everyone to, to keep moving forward without them. But, uh, Adam Kreiser was just getting to know the Gaspers. The young family of five had recently moved onto Kreiser Street in Rosetown, Saskatchewan. Our kids would, would play over there. It's, it's, it's all you'd hear during the daytime uh, in, the, in the nice weather is uh, kids up and down the, the street. It's, uh, it's going to be noticeably a, a lot quiet for, for quite a while here. 26-year-old Troy Gasper and his 28-year-old wife Carissa died on Friday, along with their three children, ages 6, 4, and 2. They were traveling on this curved part of Highway 4 north of Elrose, about 30 minutes from their home, when they collided with another vehicle. Charred grass marks the spot. A 71-year-old woman from Swift Current also died. She has not yet been identified. You can't think of a tragedy like this or many other places we've lived across this province where um, just one, one family just isn't there anymore like this. Even more so by the fact that this tragedy comes less than three months after the humble Broncos bus crash claimed 16 lives in the province. Gasper used to play for the Broncos between 2009 and 2011. It does sting that it's so close. Taylor Johnson used to play with Gasper. He got the news last night. And he was always there cheering people up pre-game when, you know, maybe I'm losing my cool and we're not playing so hot. He'd you know, quote a movie, say something stupid that just got the boys laughing and ready to play again. And, you know, you could always count on him as a, as a teammate and as a friend. Tributes are pouring in quickly, but answers will take longer. The cause of the collision is still under investigation. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Elrose, Saskatchewan. And the Saskatchewan Rough Riders paid tribute to Humboldt last night ahead of their showdown with the Montreal Alouettes, a game entitled Humboldt Strong. The Rough Riders greeted current Bronco players and family members of some of the victims. Broncos and Humboldt Strong merchandise was also sold throughout the new stadium. Proceeds go to help the families affected by April's deadly crash. We're tracking some of the developing stories this evening, starting with a tragic turn to Canada Day celebrations in Abbotsford, British Columbia. An elderly man was killed after he fell from the bed of a pickup truck and was hit by the trailer towed behind. The float had been involved in a Canada Day parade earlier in the day. Mexico has a new president, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, known by his supporters as AMLO, has won by a healthy margin. His two main rivals have conceded. AMLO is a left-leaning crusader against corruption who doesn't see eye to eye with Donald Trump. Trump has tweeted his congratulations. And disappointment for Cleveland Cavaliers fans. LeBron James is leaving again. James has agreed to a four-year, $154 million contract with the LA Lakers. His departure, good news for Cleveland's rivals in the East, and that includes the Toronto Raptors.
And in this country, Toronto Maple Leaf fans could be forgiven if this Canada Day felt more like Christmas Day. They learned superstar John Tavares had signed with the team. He announced his intentions on Twitter, posting this picture of himself as a child, saying, not every day you live a childhood dream. So, how big a deal is Tavares? Here's Tavares in alone. Tavares, 88 moves and he scores! The 27-year-old from Mississauga, Ontario, is one of the NHL stars. And over the first nine seasons of his career, he was a leader of the New York Islanders. He is an impact player in his prime. Shoots tip, score! A hat-trick for John Tavares! Accumulating 621 points in 669 regular season games, he helped Team Canada defend his gold medal at the Sochi Olympics. Tavares coming to Toronto is the biggest free agent signing in Leaf history. A seven-year contract worth $77 million U.S. So much joy and optimism in Toronto today for Maple Leaf fans, of course, and as Greg Ross tells us, from the newest member of the team as well. It was once in a lifetime, I felt like, and I'm just like, you know, why don't you go out there and grab it? And When it came right down to it, John Tavares says a big part of his decision to sign with the Leafs was about fulfilling a childhood dream. As a kid, you know, cheering up, cheering for the Leafs growing up, um, you know, you start to get those feelings again. Tavares played much of his minor hockey in Toronto. Now he comes full circle, agreeing to a seven-year contract with the Leafs, news worth celebrating for some fans. Yeah! Tavares! I love him! And they believe there will be much more celebrating to come. 2019, we're winning the Cup. We are winning the Cup. Are you literally shaking right now? I am somewhat shaking, yeah. I'm, I, it's, it's up there. It's like one of the best Leafs moments I've ever witnessed. Tavares' jerseys were suddenly in high demand at the Leafs' official store. As soon as the news broke, somebody was in the store, and right away, boom, at the cash register. That was this man. I just came down here. I tried my luck. I said uh, maybe I could buy a shirt, and I did. Do you think this is the biggest signing in Leaf history? Well, I'll tell you, let's put it this way. It's the biggest sighting since they last won the Stanley Cup. Sportsnet hockey analyst John Shannon says the Leafs were already on the verge of something big with a core of young players led by Austin Matthews. Now this move puts them among the league's elite teams. This is a team since its inception has never had one of the top ten players in the National Hockey League. Finally, the Maple Leafs, with all the players that have played here, are on the verge of having not just one superstar, but two superstars. And those fans hope this hometown hero will be the piece of the puzzle that will help this city break a Stanley Cup drought that has lasted more than five decades. Tavares knows all too well what that would mean to this city. It's hard to put that in words, right? Um, people have been waiting for it for a long time. People are hungry for it. Uh, the passion for the game, the passion for their Maple Leafs is, uh, is unprecedented. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. You know, Rosemary, I'm in Vancouver to, tonight. You obviously are in Ottawa. And, and I was saying, I love the fact that on Canada Day, the topic of conversation among many people was this signing. In your circles as well? No. <laughs> and you know that. I know. <laughs> but I will, I will say this. I feel like that's a lot of pressure for one dude as he comes back. Now you guys are going to win the cup. It just seems like it's a lot. Maybe just let him get there, ease into things. That's what I would yeah. say. Yeah. Well, no, nobody on the Maple Leafs eases into things in Toronto. That's for sure. Yeah, no, that's clear. Okay. <laughs> Still ahead on the National. Russia has got its World Cup party on. Our Chris Brown points out that the soccer hype is going a long way to soften the country's image. And what better way to celebrate Canada Day than interview a man who's experienced just about all of this country? Why not revisit my interview with the Rick Mercer? That's just ahead. And behind the scenes of history, Thomas Dagler gets a look at the preparations by members of the Royal Canadian Air Force as they take a stint for the first time as the Queen's Guard. I did get a chance to go down through the uh, crowd just look at them. I'm like, wow. You know, you know what I mean? And then I understand exactly what we're there for. So it's a real honor. And I just hope I don't mess it up. Moscow's World Cup fan zone earlier today as the Russians knocked out heavily favored Spain after two exhausting hours of regular time resulted in a 1-1 tie. 
Russia prevailed on penalty kicks, and that triggered a celebration that spilled onto the streets. Russia! Russia! Seems like nothing can compete with World Cup fever in Russia right now, not even tying the knot, apparently. Just ask this wedding party in St. Petersburg. <laughs> or these people on vacation thousands of kilometers away. All of them ecstatic over Russia's unexpected success. And so whatever happens next, the Russian players can hold their heads high. They started this tournament ranked last, and now they move on to the quarterfinals against Croatia. And as Chris Brown reports from Moscow, it's not just the players shattering expectations. Russia champion! The World Cup has brought out a side of Russia, Welcome to Russia. that even Russians seem surprised at. <laughs> it's like we're not in Russia, she says, as Nikolskaya Street near the Kremlin turns into a spontaneous party day after day. It's amazing atmosphere. Like Russia, it's very friendly country, and a lot of <laughs> look, look at this. The dominant view here is that all of this fun shatters myths perpetuated by hostile Western governments about Russia, that it's menacing and unfriendly. Anna Prolopieva is part of a group of singing Russian grannies, and she sees the World Cup as a public relations win for the Kremlin. This is good, she says, because the international media has written garbage about us, and now people can see for themselves who we really are. But the happy scenes would also seem to undermine Russian propaganda too, that Westerners hate us and foreigners should be treated with suspicion. Are you surprised? Yes, very. Why? Because uh, we think the uh, foreign people uh, don't like <laughs> Russia. Also striking is how Russian authorities have handled the crowds with relaxed police officers rather than the usual practice of barriers. Filmmaker Yulia Melamed says on a personal level, experiencing such a sense of freedom and connections can be powerful. But afterwards, don't expect it will change the Putin government or its relations with the West. It's very childish to believe that uh, our relationship between our countries will improve. No, I do not believe this. But for people, it is it is very important experience. These unusually chatty Russian policemen confirmed as much to us that when the last whistle blows, it's back to normal. And that will be stopped because the Russian law are not allowed drinking on the street. But uh, until the end of the World Cup, it's possible. But for now, in Moscow, until that final World Cup game, it seems like almost anything is possible. Chris Brown, CBC News, Moscow. That's a different side of Russia for sure. From coast to coast to coast, Rick Mercer has seen plenty of what this country has to offer. So who better to hear from on Canada Day? Next on The National, my interview with Rick as he prepared to leave the Mercer Report. When we started, I would show up in a town and a kid would see me and they would know me from television and they'd say like, what are you doing here? Because that's the way kids feel about their town, no matter where they, what are you doing here? And then uh, like in the second year, I was in the interior of British Columbia in a small town and this kid said, I knew you'd show up eventually. <laughs> and I thought, we've done it, we've broken through. Canada. We are a large northern landmass, and by and large, we have enjoyed 141 years of peace, order, and good government. And our official summer sport is lacrosse. Basically, that's all you need to know. <laughs> He's always been as Canadian as the Rockies, as spirited as a bottle of screech. The host of the Rick Mercer Report stepped down from, well, this version of a soapbox earlier this season, but not before we got the chance to ask him a few questions. And on this Canada Day, we revisit that interview. How did you get to that point where you said, I want to go to all these weird places that nobody's heard of and nobody goes to? What, why, um, what made you do that in the first place? That was right, right off the start. That was 
part of the idea for the show. Um, you know, I was on This Hour's 22 Minutes for eight years, and uh, I got to do a bit of traveling on that show, and I, and I always loved that, and I always wanted to go to Nunavut, and uh, there was always a reason not to go to Nunavut, mm -hmm. and, oh, no, it's too expensive, or, you know, it's, it's this or it's that, and so when I got this show, one of the very first places we went to was Nunavut, and there was a suggestion that, you know, you're opening the show, it's early in its tenure, you know, the GTA has millions and millions of people, you should shoot in the GTA, and we stuck to our guns, and we said, no, we're going to Nunavut, and I think people responded to that. You know, people have an innate interest in the country, they want to travel the country, uh, they can't always do that, but they get to live vicariously through the show. And through you. Yeah. What about those travels surprised you the most? Because I have a similar job where I get to go places mm -hmm. where people wouldn't get to go and see things people wouldn't get to see. What surprised you about some of that? One of the great things that happened to me uh, when we started, I would show up in a town and a kid would see me and they would know me from television and they'd say like, what are you doing here? Because that's the way kids feel about their town, no matter where they, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. And then uh, like in the second year, I was in the interior of British Columbia in a small town and this kid said, I knew you'd show up eventually. <laughs> and I thought, we've done it, we've broken through. That's the show I want. Yeah. And, uh, and that's probably what I'm the most proud of really, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Newfoundland because there is, I mean, obviously you love it, it's mm -hmm. a special place for you, but it does seem to be a place that uh, has a lot of talent, musicians, comedians. Why, why do you think that is? Well, we don't shut up is one of them. We don't shut up. Uh, Fair. We like to talk. Uh, we have lots of opinions, but uh, there's certainly a lot of us. You know, Tom is there who now hosts yes. Q yeah. and then, you know, and Critch is there yeah. from 22 Minutes. And yeah. Speaking of Critch, he sent you a little message. He did not. Yes, he did. When I was in high school, all of St. John's was raving about Rick Mercer's one-man show, Show Me the Button, I'll Push It, or Charles Lynch Must Die. It was sold out, but I volunteered to tear tickets so I could go see it. And that was in 1991, and Rick, I've been watching your rant ever since. I know you're stepping away, but whenever you feel the need to pace and shout about Ottawa, you're welcome back here at your old alma mater. I'll keep the desk warm for you. Congratulations from all of us here at 22 Minutes. Beers on me at the ship pub this summer. That's very nice. Where's the ship pub? Is everyone going to be there this summer? <laughs> oh, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> I send you with it's, bodyguards? It's a right across the street from the LSPU Hall where I did that show oh. and where Critch, uh, yeah, took tickets. Um, the thing that you and I have in common is, is politics. Mm -hmm. A love of politics, I think, yep. yes. Um, and you, you took, I don't know if I can say take the piss out of someone, but that's what you were doing most sure. of the time. Yeah. Did you ever do it and thought that you stepped over a line or someone got angry certainly lots of people got angry with you mm -hmm. and then you thought maybe that was too much there were certainly times um, I've always found that cabinet ministers and prime ministers and premiers people who are in that business they have a very thick skin yep. they actually that it doesn't bother them it bothers the people around them mm -hmm. because as you know in Ottawa every cabinet minister has a number of young people working yep. with them and those young people think that that cabinet minister is the greatest gift to democracy since Nelson Mandela <laughs> and uh, they are convinced it's only a matter of time until the entire world sees what a great man or woman that person is and so they're very sensitive those people are was there anyone that wouldn't play ball that surprised like and you thought oh this would help you if you just went on? I mean you know, over the years, uh, you know, I kind of backed away from it because yeah. I decided I didn't want to do that as much anymore. But over the years, we had tremendous access. There was, um, I remember when Michael Ignatieff said he couldn't come on the show, but then he would, was interested in seeing samples of my work. <laughs> <laughs> because we were, he was like a 22 what? And did you send them? Well, no, we were like, oh, I guess we could dig up samples. I suppose it's, it's on the CBC. That's it. Well, well, well. Um, well that but, sums up a lot. Yeah. There. <laughs> he eventually came on the show, of course. And how do you feel about political satire? Because I, I think about when you started 15 mm -hmm. years ago, there, there weren't a million people doing that at that time. Not 15 years ago. No. And, and there are now. I, I think oh, there's, there's a ton yes. now. And when we started 22 Minutes, it was... Uh, it was groundbreaking in a lot yes. of ways. I don't. I don't. I hate to say that because no, it sounds was. like it oh, was. I was groundbreaking. No, it but was. in this building, For sure. uh, people were freaking out because people were saying they look like a news show. They can't look like a news show. People are thinking it's the news. And where did they get that news footage? And uh, you know, some very powerful people let us have that news footage. Uh, but there was also very powerful people who were like, "This is crossing a line. They cannot be playing with 
news footage. Yeah. And there was, uh, so it was groundbreaking. It was exciting. And occasionally, we did things that, you know, they became the story themselves. Uh, you know, when I launched uh, the Stockwell Day petition <laughs> that one, yep. for Stockwell Day to change his name to Doris Day. Now, the petition simply states, we demand that the government of Canada force Stockwell Day to change his first name <laughs> to Doris. The week before I decided to do that, we realized this hour's 22 minutes didn't have a website or a domain name. Like, it was that long ago. TV shows didn't have... <laughs> Websites. So we're like, well, we'll create one of these new fancy websites we're hearing about. And it became a Took real off. story yeah. inside of an election. That was pretty exciting. I don't know if you have a favorite politician. Like, is that possible? I don't know. I mentioned Nelson Mandela. Yes, okay. <laughs> he was a pretty good one. All right, maybe this guy. Hang on. Well, the Northern Lights have seen strange sights. Yes. But the strangest they ever did see with the, the day Bob Ray with Rick Mercer did play on the shores of Lake Killarney. Oh, it was pretty rough to see them both in the buff. Rick Mercer with Bob at his side. But if truth be told, they're both pretty old and they didn't have much to hide. That's a long Rick, poem. Oh, there's what still a still. life we've had together. Oh, I know you haven't seen me in quite a while because, you know, I've returned to my obscurity, which has been so richly deserved, only illuminated occasionally by a visit in the airport or somewhere where a guy will come up to me and say, Bob, nice ass. Thank you, Rick. And thank you, Canada, for watching. <laughs> I'd also like to thank you, because I had to interview him knowing what his ass looked like. <laughs> he was a good sport. He was a good sport. Yeah. He was a good sport that day. Yeah. To get naked and jump in a lake. And at the time, I mean, he was running for the leadership of yes. the Liberal Party, yeah. so he had to make a call right there. And he was one of the few people that, uh, of that level that I uh, spent time with that came completely alone. There, there was no, no there was no entourage, no one to say, are you, no, you are not doing that. He was like, yeah, I'll do it. It's because we didn't catch any fish. Oh, so you had to do something. We had to do something. Oh, Otherwise, people would have looked at us and said, wow, those guys are morons. Yeah. They're up there in you yeah. know, northern yeah. Ontario in this beautiful, pristine wilderness. They can't catch a fish. Too bad we didn't catch any fish. I know. Know. I know, but that's not what it's about, Bob. No, what is it? It's, Tell me what it's, it's about. It's about what the memories, fishing? Bob. Oh, the memories. And we okay. still have to get that one memorable moment. I have an idea. Let's talk about the rants. That's Rick Mercer rehearsing his final rant in Graffiti Alley. We were able to follow him while he prepared. Is his son um, killing I was you? Say, yeah, can you just take the half a second? This back? is one of the challenges of shooting in the alley. See, the sun shifts. People have no idea how hard we got it. Now we have to step into a. There we go. Um, let's talk about the rants. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I've heard the story. These are the things you write yourself in your office. Yeah. You decide what you want to talk about. Sure. Oh, absolutely. And and how did they evolve over the 15 years? Um, my opinion has certainly evolved. Yeah. Sometimes they're more personal now. Yeah. I realized over the last number of years that I didn't always try. I didn't always have to be funny. Uh, I think when I started, they were commentary, but I was a little more focused on on being clever. And I realized that wasn't necessarily what was important. And I never lost track of the fact that it was a huge privilege to be able to do. Because think of it, we're all, you know, so many Canadians rant and have an opinion. <laughs> to get to do it on national television every single week, it's, it's a gift. You know, that's the greatest thing that's ever happened to me in my career, that I get to do that. And in many ways, I view the whole show as wrapped around that moment. Did you mem do you memorize it? I always wondered that. Oh, yeah. I always memorize oh, the yeah. rants. Yeah, there's no teleprompter. Do you do it once? Uh, I have done it once on occasion, but I often have to do it 15, 20 times. No. Well, it's an alley, and the alley is also a functioning Busy. alley. Delivery trucks go through there. People take shortcuts through there. Art students are taking photos nonstop now because of the, the artwork that's there. And then there's other trade that goes on in alleys. There's, <laughs> you know, you have to dodge dead rats. 
and my cameraman, Don Spence, yes. is going backwards. Yes, yes. no, that's so, not fun. And there's no. ice, and he trips and falls. I mean, there's a lot of things that can go wrong. Those ramps, though, I, I think they became, you said they were the, what you built the show around. I, I think so, too. They were the parts that people tuned in for to see what you had to say in a given week. And there were some that were very, very powerful. That really, you know, the voting one mm -hmm. resonated really deeply at a moment where people needed maybe to hear that. It is the conventional wisdom of all political parties that young people will not vote. And the parties, they like it that way. It's why your tuition keeps going up. The bullying against gay kids. Mm -hmm. But you want to say to these kids who are being bullied, you know what? You're right. These are not the best days of your life. In fact, these are probably the worst. But after this, they get better. And then, believe it or not, they get great. Trust me, I'm one of the smartest guys I know. It turned into a news story. I mean, that, yeah. was, that was the power of, your, of yeah, those the... moments and your voice. Do you, do, you, do you grasp that? Occasionally, you know that one of the rants has really resonated. And I know that they're not all going to resonate no. like that. No. But occasionally, they do resonate. I mean, the, the anti-bullying rant, uh, it traveled all around the world. Yeah. Someone sent me an article and they said, you know, this, this man in Canada has this to say, why he's walking around in that alley, we have no idea. <laughs> like, they were like, what is he doing? <laughs> and occasionally I got to rant about something that uh, wasn't in the media at all. Yeah. I just thought that maybe attention. people should know about. Three years ago, the Harper government went to court in a fight with Canadian veterans. My friend Paul Franklin, you know, has no legs because he lost his legs in Afghanistan. And he was constantly having to prove to Veterans Affairs that yes. he still had no legs. Yes. Now, I knew like this. Like other people, too. Yeah. yeah. And I knew this mm -hmm. about him because he would tell me about it. And then I would say, can I do something about this? Mm -hmm. He would say, no, because soldiers don't complain. So you're just going to suck it up? Yep. That's just the way it is. And then eventually he said, yeah, OK, you can. You know, the fourth time he had to prove he, mm. his legs mm. hadn't grown back. So the next time you bump into an MP and they're telling you how much this government does for veterans, don't take them at their word. Tell them to prove it. And so I got to rant about that. And then it became a, a story. public policy issue. And it yeah. became a yeah. public policy issue. Yeah. And, you know, and the minister stood up and said, we're going to fix this. Yeah. So now he only has to prove that his legs haven't grown back every two years. Oh, lovely. Used to be every year. <laughs> So now he's got, so that's progress. That's change. <laughs> change you can believe in. But you do, yeah. but, you, but we're, we're laughing about it. But those were powerful moments well, for the country. I, do, I really do think that. Well, thank you very much. I, I, you know, there's been so many rants, and I like to think that some of them resonated. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I feel pretty good about that. Are you sad at all? I'm sad, sure. I'm also excited. The, you know, I would never complain about the show because... You know, like, look at this. Like, mm. if you want a career in show business or comedy, this is what you want your entire life. When you're a kid, you want a studio like this with your set and these cameras. I Made mean, this, for you. Is, yeah. this is this is as good as it gets. And the fact that we've gotten 15 years is tremendous. And I would never complain about it, but it is all encompassing. Sure. It takes up a lot of time, yep. and uh, I'm excited about doing other things. I don't know what they are yet, but I'm excited about that. I'm excited for you. Thank you. And I know you won't go away. Oh, where am I going? No, I'm not going to no. be tiring. No. You know, people keep saying, happy retirement. I'm like, oh, I never said it was retiring. Well, good luck. Thank you. Congratulations. Cheers. Thank okay. you. Those two have pretty good chemistry. Uh, still ahead on the national, a Canada Day honour for a Toronto police officer hailed a hero. But first, we want to tell you about a special project we have for Canada Day online. Meet Canada's 10 to watch, 10 young people who are taking it upon themselves to change their communities, their country, and their world. I want everyone to achieve their goals and dreams and to always love themselves. My work is about how we might begin to imagine a world in which Indigenous flourishing is possible. This is about my generation stepping up and saying, it's time to do something. I'm grateful that I had a chance to grow up in such a place that provided me with such opportunity. You can do anything, even if you're young. Can engage in our political Just a taste of the resolve and commitment of some of these remarkable young people. You can find their stories online on our Facebook and Twitter pages at CBC The National. I want people to believe in themselves.
The Royal Canadian Air Force is not just standing on guard for thee this Canada Day. Some in the RCAF are standing on guard for the Queen. The CBC's Thomas Degla takes us inside as members get ready for their royal duties. It's the big test before the even bigger show. In the middle of London, they've come to demonstrate they can march and drill with pomp and pageantry just as well as anyone from anywhere. This is way up on the top of the bucket list. As far as I'm concerned, this is something that you can never do again. The Royal Canadian Air Force. In its 94-year history, never before have members guarded the Queen here at her home. Just uh, living up to the, uh, the standard that the British have set uh, for us, um, just, just ensuring that we were able to meet that was definitely going through my mind. Every move, every detail here is scrutinized by the brigade major of Britain's household division. And it's not just the moves under examination, it's the uniform too. In the suit and tie, that's a master tailor looking every bit the roll, inspecting each crease. Every tradition is rehearsed and reviewed here, like the ceremony of the keys, performed nightly at the Tower of London since the 14th century. Who comes there? The keys. Whose keys? When it's all said and done, it's time for the group photo. The Canadians so confident about their performance, they even invite their British trainer to pose with them. We can all automatically see a, a huge difference from how it was on the drill square back in Winnipeg. Again, the, the guys have set a standard today and I was quite pleased with that. Yes, they've passed the inspection, but another day brings another challenge. They've come back carrying the tools they'll need for the show itself. The changing of the guard at Buckingham Palace, not to mention guard duties at other regal addresses like the Tower of London. Warrant Officer Jason Patterson did two tours of duty in Afghanistan, but nothing quite like this. Uh, I did get a chance to go down through the uh, Crown Jewels and look at them. I'm like, wow, you know, you know what I mean? And then I understand exactly what we're there for. So it's a real honor. And I just hope I don't mess it up, <laughs> to be honest. The contingents formed of 120 members from right across Canada. Some volunteered, others were hand-picked. As for the Air Force Band, they've come from Winnipeg with a long list of songs to put their own touch on a very British tradition. We do have a very identifiable and very clearly Canadian sound. And I want people to hear the difference and say, you know, they do it right in Canada. Finally, it's time for the crowds to hear that sound. Air Force members marching to the beat just as they'd rehearsed, not letting the legion of tourists distract them now. The spectacle, the music, all within an earshot of Elizabeth herself. Yes, she's here, judging by the royal standard flying high above. A slow march in the forecourt of Buckingham Palace signals the new guard's arrival. They display their weapons as a sign of respect for their counterparts. Major Véronique Gagné meets the captain of the old guard. He hands her the keys to the palace. It's symbolic, really. There are no keys, and this place hasn't been locked that way in years. With just a bit more pageantry left, the Queen's foot guards, in their unmistakable uniforms, give way to those blues from Canada, a moment never seen before. I'm making sure that everyone realized this as well, that we are making history, and that just makes them even prouder of being here. As the big show winds down, the centuries will keep watch. It's not just spectacle, it's guard duty, a job out of their reach until now. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. Well, today was the so-called Canada Day 
classic baseball game in Toronto, though for the Jays, not so classic, they lost 9-1. But the ceremonial opening pitch was pretty special. It featured Ken Lamb, the Toronto police officer, who arrested the man charged in the deadly van attack in April. And that is our moment of the day. Constable Lamb was the officer who, on that day in April, with the help of colleagues, was the officer that apprehended and arrested the suspect in the attack. So listen to that applause. Constable Lamb was hailed a hero when he arrested the van attack suspect, not shooting, holstering his gun and peacefully arresting the driver. Lamb honored today alongside Lieutenant General Michael Rouleau with Blue Jays players John Axford and Marcus Stroman on hand to catch that first pitch. Constable Lamb, Lieutenant General Rulo, it's your pitch. So that, that's pretty cool because, of course, we haven't really seen much of Constable Lamb. We certainly haven't heard from him uh, since all of this unfolded. Um, and I guess, well, one of the reasons that he says he's not going to talk to the media is because he's a witness in, in this trial, uh, that it's still yet to get underway. But it's pretty neat to see him because we talked about him so much that day. Yeah, you and I were live on CBC News Network, and I do remember when we saw that video of the arrest, yeah. we could tell right away how remarkably calm he was under pressure. And it's so nice to see the joy from him. You don't often see this from police officers, the joy from him uh, at the game. Yeah, and he got a lot of credit for that de-escalation, right, taking Alec Manassian mm -hmm. down, I think it was 30 seconds, 37 seconds. Um, but he was very, very humble, everyone said, after it happened. And he didn't shoot, and so, um, you know, it gives us a chance to maybe get some answers as to what happened that day. That is The National for Sunday, July 1st. Happy Canada Day. Good night.